Let us take a moment as we prepare our hearts to hear God's Word as His Spirit attends to our need today. Let us all pray. Our loving Father, we gather for these moments again around the sacred page. We come that we might hear and learn as the Holy Spirit, the one who guides us into truth, carries the message of heaven into the depth of our heart today. We recognize that we are slow of learning. Often our ears are dull. The temptations of life crowd in upon us, and its distractions would draw us away from true worship. But Lord, we ask that you will bring every thought now into captivity to your will, that you will cover us neath the precious blood of Christ, that the devil will have no sway or say within our hearts today, but being protected by the will of God and by the purpose of your grace and mercy, may the word that goes forth from your mouth not return void, but accomplish that which you please and prosper in the very thing to which you send it. And may all of us today who are under the sound of your word be compelled to focus, to comprehend, and to seek an application of that word into our hearts so that we might be truly blessed. Help us not to miss the slightest whisper of your grace, but as the mighty hand of God is outstretched, may we see and know that as the psalmist reminds us in the hand of God there is power. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. May this be proved again today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> we are returning this morning to the first verses of John chapter 18 as we continue through the theme that has been introduced to us in the opening verse. So far we have noted there is a fragrant garden, there is a rippling brook, Last week we noted a controlled environment and this morning we're going to take a moment to look at a trembling knee. And the text, if you desire one, is found in verse 6, although our journey through the scriptures today will take us into both the Old and through uh, the New Testament. We begin with verse 4 where we note that Jesus has asked a question. It is pertinent, it is relevant, it is appropriate, particularly in the light of the fact that Jesus knows all things that would come upon him. And already having discussed that in our last study, we recognize that Jesus now is moving, yea, he is marching toward the very thing for which he had come into the world in order to fulfill the Father's will to go to the cross where he would die and yield his life and purchase by his blood the redemption, the salvation of his people. Now, knowing that this would soon come to pass, Jesus moves out of the shelter and the shade of the garden, where in this open area he is now confronted, verse 3, 
by this mob that have been assembled under authority and now under the guidance of Judas, who is to be the betrayer of Jesus. Verse 3 tells us of a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests, that is, the Sadducees and Pharisees. And they have come there with their lanterns, their torches, and their weapons. They have come on a mission, and they are about to be confronted by the one who is here on the mission of fulfilling his Father's will. In verse 4, Jesus now approaches not only his enemies, but also the very subject that will now lead eventually to his death upon the cross. Verse 4, he simply asks, Whom are you seeking? Who are you looking for? Why are you here? What is the reason for your coming at this particular time to this particular place for whatever purpose is intended in your heart. Whom are you seeking? And then in verse 5, we have the answer. Or at least we have the answer as it appears on the superficial surface of their thinking. The answer they give is, Jesus of Nazareth. So as far as they are concerned, they have a specific aim. There is a determined reason for their being present at this particular time. They are here to make an arrest of a man called Jesus of Nazareth. Now you will notice that we are moving around in the shadows of a human understanding limited by the presence of sin. Therefore, their question is superficial as they follow what is the intention of these leaders represented by the soldiers and the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees. They could have said at this point, we are looking for you. But you will note the absence of specific recognition. Now, we're going to dwell on this a little bit later in our study. But it comes in as significantly important. Who are you looking for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He was right there before them, and even though they had their torches and their lanterns, the one who had spent three years ministering among them and to them, who had often faced the crowds, and in particular the chief priests, that is the Sadducees, and the Pharisees, who time after time had confronted and insulted him in his ministry. And now, at this particular moment, they fail to recognize who he is. If you go over into Acts 17, and we'll be looking at this in our evening service tonight, in verse 27 there, when Paul stands on Mars Hill and uh, confronts the Athenians in response to their seeking through philosophy to understand the various gods and the elements of worship that ought to be ascribed to their gods, you will recall how the Apostle Paul focuses in on one altar to the unknown god, and he defines and specifies and, and injects into their thinking 
the concrete evidence of a God who is supreme and sovereign over all other gods. And then he drops into the mix this bombshell by confessing he is not far from any one of us. Now, how close can you be? These who had come to arrest Jesus are standing before him. He's not far from any one of us. But yet, in the blindness of their mind and of their heart, they fail to recognize who Jesus really is. If you were to go around on the streets of our city, and even perhaps into some of our churches across our nation, and ask individually of those who are present or those whom you meet, who is Jesus? You might well be surprised and disappointed to recognize that while the means of grace is readily available, the gospel is being preached, the good news about Jesus is being taught, yet there are many who, though they have the enlightenment of torch and lantern, do not recognize Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, in verses 3 and 4, you might like to turn in your Bible to that text and just underline and underscore in your mind and heart how the Apostle Paul brings this thought into the troubled church of Corinth, mixed up in their, in their confused thoughts in relation to worship and to the divine visitation of God to the congregation. They are unsure of many of the doctrines of the church. They're unsure of many of the practices of worship. And the Apostle Paul puts his finger upon the reason why there is so much dissension and disunity and lack of discernment in the church in Corinth, as in verses 3 and 4 of 2 Corinthians 4, he writes, Whose mind? Brother, verse 3, But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the glory, uh, light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Satan has blinded the eyes of those who do not believe, lest they should see the glory of God. Now look at verse 6. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. And here we are transported back to Genesis chapter 1, where God said, let there be light, and there was light. Who initiated the light? It was God. Now read on in verse 6. Who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So those who have been blinded by the God of this world, lest they see the glory of God revealed in the face of Christ, need the quickening of God to give to them, to bring to them that understanding, that revelation, that conviction, that knowledge of Christ in all his glory and in all his beauty. These who have come are now in the presence of the one whom they're seeking after, but they cannot recognize him because their minds and their eyes are blind. So what happens? Look at verse 6. We're back into John chapter 18. Look at verse 6. Now when he said to them, 
I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. I want you to note that it does not say that they fell backwards. It simply tells us they fell back or they drew back and then they fell to the ground. Why does one draw back? If you're standing close to someone, why do you draw back? You draw back to give you a little space. Why do they need a little space? Because they're just about to fall to the ground. But before we get into that, and we're going to look at this in a little more detail, I want you to come back into verse 5. Now you will see that if we were to read the first part, part of verse 5, we could go straight into verse 6. And I'm going to do that just to highlight what comes in at the end of the fifth verse. They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Now when he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Would that not have covered the completeness of this account by missing out the last part of verse 5? But the very fact that it's there means that we must catch the meaning. We must see its significance. We must recognize why it fits into this fifth verse. Here is the statement. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now here is the significance. Judas, one of the disciples, does not stand with Jesus, but he stands with them. Having gone out from the presence of the Lord in the upper room, from the company of the disciples, he has now aligned himself to those who are seeking the death of Jesus. And when those who profess to be followers of Christ turn and step once again into the environs of the world, it is not long before they are surrounded by haters of Jesus. And just as the dog returns to its vomit or the pig returns to the trough, they discover that their latter end is more regretful than their former. The one devil that has been cast out has returned and brought seven devils with it. And their end is even greater in dismay and despair. Here is Judas. He stood with them. Now come into verse 6. They drew back and fell to the ground. Where is Judas? He is with them. So now Judas draws back and Judas falls to the ground, along with the soldiers and the chief priests and the Pharisees. They fall at his word. His word is a display of his divinity. His word is a display of his sovereignty. His word is a display of his majesty. Now, to understand the full impact of this, we must take a little closer look at the response of Jesus. Come back into verse 5. Jesus said, when they asked the question, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He said, I am he. The words that are translated, I am he, in this text 
come from the Greek ego, meaning I, and imi, meaning am, or I am, uh, some other uh, term or title. The word is used in three different ways in John's Gospel. We don't want to go into this in, in great detail, but we do need to understand the thrust of what Jesus is saying here. The word ego imi appears, first of all, with a predicate. Now, that simply means it's, a, it's an illustration or, or it's a continuation of the theme in order to make it more realistic and more understandable. You'll find that it's used by Jesus on a number of occasions. The seven great I Ams of Christ are a prime example of its use in this form. Jesus said, for example, I am the bread of life. I am the light of of the world. I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine. So all through John's gospel, Jesus is building up this understanding of what and who the I am represents. The second use is with an implied predicate. I am he, or I am the one. And you'll find that this is used particularly to, to confirm that he is the Messiah that Israel are seeking. And you'll find that in chapter 4, Verse 26, chapter 8, verse 24, and 28, and chapter 13, verse 19. And you'll also find the word is used in this similar way just to confirm to his disciples who he is. In John 6, verse 20, and John 18, and uh, verse 8, I am he. And so here in this 18th chapter of John's gospel, that is the the thought, I am he. That is, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the way, the truth, and life, and all of these things, Jesus confirms, I am he. Notice they have asked for Jesus of Nazareth. But Jesus has responded that above and beyond that, having come in his humanity, he is still the Son of God in his majesty and sovereignty. And then there's the third use, and I want to just take you to some of these texts. You'll find it used as an absolute. Come back into John chapter 8. John chapter 8. And uh, verse 58, John 8, verse 58. And this is in dispute with some of these leaders who have now sent their representatives to arrest him. And it's no wonder that he got under their spiritual ecclesiastical skin. And you'll often find that just as a thorn gets under your skin and it penetrates and it hurts, if a thorn of truth gets under ecclesiastical skin, it hurts even more. Attack a man's religion and you'll attack that man. And here Jesus is responding to the aggression and arrogance of these religious leaders of his time. And as he explains exactly who he is and why he has come, they are becoming more and more agitated and irritated. How many times can you challenge a sinner about their sin before they want to do something terrible to you? If their heart is rebelling against God. But read here how Jesus responds in this uh, discussion, debate, or, or argument. 
In verse 56, Jesus said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. The Jews then said to him, You are not yet 50 years old, and have you seen Abraham? That's impossible. It's impossible. But Jesus answered to them, verse 58, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I was. Is that the answer? No. I am. That's the eternal nature of Christ. Before Abraham, who had a beginning and an end. Before Abraham was, I am. Without beginning, without end. And so the response here, I am, takes us right back, remember, to the burning bush. And remember how at the burning bush, Moses, in his panic as he was challenged to go back into Egypt, he had left some time previously as an exile, and he knew that as soon as he stepped back into the country, something awful might happen. And so he tries to wriggle out of it. But in the end, God confirms his presence with him and the overshadowing of his power And when Moses asked, who will I say sent me? Remember the response, I am has sent you. He was the great I am in the times of creation. The great I am in the days of Noah, in the days of Abraham, in the days of the disciples, the early church, and he remains a great I am of your day and mine. I am. So here, ego emi represents the divine name of God. Come over into Isaiah chapter 43. Isaiah 43. Let's look at verse 25. I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. What a word of comfort and consolation to the heart burdened by sin. Here is the one who by his presence can banish all our sin. Forgiveness and grace and reconciliation and redemption all purchased by the shedding of the precious blood of Christ. Come over into chapter 51 of Isaiah and look at verse 12. I, even I, am he who comforts you. Who are you that you should be afraid of a man who will die and of the Son of Man who will be made like grass? The great I am. And so here in John chapter 18 and verse 5, when Jesus replied, I am he, he is doing two things. He is offering first a declaration of his identity. He is truly the one whom they are seeking. But second, he is offering a demonstration of his sovereignty. He goes above and beyond his humanity. And here he stands in the garden just about to engage in that final warfare and triumph over sin and Satan on the cross, where he would cry, It is finished. Here Jesus now declares both his identity and his sovereignty. And that is why then in verse 6 we read, When he said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. 
Now the question is, did they fall backwards or did they fall forwards? We'll come back next week. No, we'll have, we'll have that thought just now. Come with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. And that was a little bit of good news and a little bit of bad news because you were probably thinking, oh good, he's coming to the end. Philippians chapter 2. And let's just read from verse 9 through to uh, verse 11. Having told us about the coming of Jesus, the one who was equal with God, yet he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, verse 9, we read, Therefore God has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee of every believer will bow. That's not what your Bible reads. Every knee. The knee of the saint and the knee of the sinner will one day bow at the name of Jesus. Now, how does your knee bow? If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, I want you to bend your knees. How do you bend or bow your knees? You go forward. Your knee doesn't bend backwards. It goes forward. When these soldiers fell to the ground, having drawn back, they fall on their knees before the majesty of Jesus. And the scriptures are very firm, and yet they are confident in describing to us what will take place in the end when Christ comes to judge the world in righteousness. Here we are told at his name every knee shall bow. And if you bow the knee then as a sinner, unsaved, unconverted, unredeemed, then you will be banished from his presence for all eternity. Hence the gospel proclaims the good news that for those who bow the knee here and now, as the Spirit of God ministers to our heart and calls us to follow Jesus, if God so works within us, and we bow the knee to his majesty and his grace. Then when we bow the knee on that great day of his coming, it will be to worship him. It will not be to hear those awful words, depart from me, I never knew you. And so here in verse 6 of John 18, we're told, that immediately they drew back and fell to the ground. Now you'll notice that we're not told how long this lasted. How long were they on the ground? The next verse simply brings in our repetition of the question and the answer. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. What does this tell us? It simply tells us that they still don't get the message. Remember the rich man who died and went to hell. And in the awful plight that he found himself in with no escaping the vengeance and wrath of a holy God. He pleaded with those in Abraham's bosom that someone go back from the dead to warn his brothers lest they find themselves in this awful place. 
And remember the answer that came back. Even if some were to rise from the dead and go to warn his brothers, they still would not respond. They still would not listen. And here are these soldiers and chief priests and Pharisees, and they're now falling down before Christ. They are being smitten by the power of his name and by the sound of his voice. But when they rise to their feet once more, they still do not recognize who he is. They could now at least have said, we're looking for you. But no, they reply, we're still looking for Jesus of Nazareth. And let me tell you, dear friend, if your only contact with the gospel and with the Christian church is by singing carols around the tree at Christmas or standing at a nativity play or being involved in all of the tinsel and the enjoyment that comes with that season of the year, if all the distance you've traveled in your understanding of God is the manger in Bethlehem, then you will know nothing of the forgiving grace of God in your heart and life. It is not the birth of Jesus that saves us. It's his death on the cross. We must come to Calvary. And so here these who have been smitten down before Christ don't recognize who he is. They have been warned. They are in the presence of sovereignty. But it makes no difference. And how sad it is to be confronted by the majesty of Christ over and over and over again and to have no effect upon our mind or upon our heart. Now, just as we draw this thought to a conclusion, let me remind you of a text in Ecclesiastes 8.11, because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore is the heart of the sons of men fully set in them to do evil. There are many today who continue in their sin because God hasn't come to immediately challenge them with judgment. But remember how the stubborn heart of man can still continue in spite of the grace extended. In Matthew 27 and verse 19, Remember when Jesus is standing before Pilate. His, the wife of Pilate sends word to her husband. Have nothing to do with this just man. Because God has warned me in a dream. And what does Pilate do? He still goes on, gives in to the crowd, tries to wash his hands of the responsibility, puts the blame on those who accuse Jesus, but he hands him over to be crucified. We could move a little further through the Bible. What happened at the resurrection of Jesus? Let's just go to Matthew 28 and look at a few verses. Verses 1 to 4 of Matthew Chapter 28. And here we have the soldiers at the tomb. Uh, And I want you to note, in particular, verses 1 to 4, what happens to these uh, soldiers. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. Now we're not told that in the garden there was an earthquake. Would that have made a difference? Some might think yes. We're not told that in the garden Jesus suddenly appeared in these garments as white as snow, shining with the glory of his divinity. Had that happened, would things have been different? Let's see what happens here. Verse 4, 
and the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So what happened? They fall down like dead men. Dead men don't stand up, not as a rule. And so they fell down before the presence. But what happens? Look at verse 5, and, and I just slip this in because I think this is a cherished thought. Here we have the guards trembling, falling down as though they're dead. And what happens? The angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid. He didn't say that to the soldiers. They're lying on the ground. It's to the women. It's to his own. He says, Don't be afraid. You see, war can be raging all around us. The devil could be hurling missiles at us. His fiery darts raining in upon us. Or the judgments of God may be shaking the very foundations of the earth. But God whispers to his own, be not afraid. Don't be afraid. Now, what would you have done had you been one of these soldiers? You probably would have had second thoughts or possibly well let's go down to verse 11 now while they were going behold some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all things that had happened when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together they give a large sum of money to the soldiers saying tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while he slept and if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. <coughs> so they took the money and did as they were instructed. They had been lying on the ground, smitten at the presence of the angels from heaven, bringing the message that Christ had risen from the dead. The power of God had come upon the earth. And yet here they are accepting money and going off to tell a lie. So one minute they are stricken with fear, the next minute they're telling a fable. That's the darkened heart. That's the sinful nature. That's what happens to a Christ rejecter. They are stirred in a moment. But when that moment has passed, they slip back into their sin. And they continue to live without Christ in their rejection of him. But as we go through Scripture, we discover that the Bible is very clear in its warnings, and I just want to leave this text with you in Revelation chapter 16. Come with me to Revelation chapter 16. Would you like to be living in Syria today? Would you exchange your comfortable existence in this country to go and live in a less secure country overseas? I suggest probably not. But will Australia always be safe? The answer is no. Or we may escape some of the horrific acts of terrorism and if we do, it will only be by the grace of God. But even if we were not to experience the thrust and throes of the woes of this old crumbling world, one thing we're sure of, one day it will all come to an end. The elements will melt with a fervent heat. This old world groaning in turmoil is longing for a day of redemption. And that day will come. Let's look at Revelation 16 and verse 1. Here's what the Bible tells us uh, of the things that will take place. Look at verse 1, chapter 16. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. 
In verses 2 to 11, it describes the calamity and the carnage. Just glance down through, and as you read, you will note the awful days that will come upon the earth. But now, I want you to look at verse 9. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. Look at verse 10 and 11. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and they did not repent of their deeds. What an awful, awful condition to be under the judgment of God and yet not repent. To blame God and to curse God for the thing that has befallen us and not open our heart to receive his mercy, his love, and his grace. Can I ask you this morning, and those who are listening into our broadcast, has God put his finger upon your life? Perhaps over the years you've felt those moments when heaven has come down and you've felt the nearness of Jesus and somehow you have sensed that there is more to his name and his authority and his power and there's more to the gospel than what you have considered in the past. And your heart has been stirred. And you've been on the verge of acknowledging Christ as your Lord and Savior. But somehow you've turned and walked away. And you've gone back to your sin. And you've forgotten that call upon your heart until some other event and once again you've felt God drawing near and you've sensed that now you must take that moment and grasp it and yield to the heavenly embrace. But yet time has caused that to grow cold in your heart. And today you were listening to this service and you know that if Christ were to return at this moment, you're not ready. If Christ were to summon you to stand before his throne and the breath left your body and you were ushered immediately without warning into the presence of God, how would you fare? These soldiers were in the presence of deity and of majesty and of sovereignty. And yet their intention is not to be turned away from their sin and folly. But in their heart they pursue this to the end. And as we read in the next verses, they arrest Jesus. What will you do with Jesus today? Better and more importantly, what will he do with you? Is there in your heart a desire to seek him, to know him, to love him, to be with him? If God is drawing you by his Spirit, then yield. Yield to his embrace. And God will give you the ability of faith to believe and to see and to know that it is not the Jesus of Nazareth we seek, but it's the one who is Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the one who's been given that name above every other name, the one before whose name every knee shall bow. Will you yield your heart 
to Christ today. Ask him, plead with him to come and be your Savior. Let's pray. Our loving Father, we thank you for your word, for its authority and power. We recognize that salvation is not through works that we do. It is not through our responsiveness to the challenge of the gospel. It is not through the preaching of that word to our heart. It is only by the visitation of your Spirit the application of that word in truth and power, the quickening of your Spirit to draw sinners to Jesus, and that work of grace that takes place when we become a new creation, all things passing away and all things becoming new. Forgive us for those times we have rejected Christ, and as we come today, we pray that you will give us the ability, the spiritual discernment to yield our heart to Jesus so that we will not be hardened by the word, but rather we will be encouraged to put our trust in Jesus. O oh God, be merciful to sinners. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.